días, bienvenidos a todos a este encuentro Innovación 2050. Este espacio tiene como objeto discutir, reflexionar sobre esos temas y tendencias que representan desafíos para la sociedad en el presente y en el futuro. Esta iniciativa nació hace dos años gracias a una alianza estratégica entre el Centro de Innovación UC, Fundación Erasmus y CAP. Antes de empezar, quiero invitar a todos a encender sus cámaras. Veo que muchos ya lo hicieron por su propia iniciativa. Tenemos una gran presencia de hombres y de mujeres. Las mujeres habitualmente tenemos más disposición a hablar de este tema. Así que todos muy bienvenidos. Miren, por favor, hagamos un gran saludo de buenos días. Que Estamos juntos hoy conversando sobre salud mental. Gracias por estar acá. Esta es la forma que hemos encontrado para poder generar un vínculo, una forma más cercana de conversar de los temas que nos importan y que nos desafían en el mediano y en el largo plazo. Hace un año y medio, ya sabemos, por eso estamos así, un virus nos obligó a cambiar radicalmente nuestra vida. Se cree que uno de los grandes impactos que vamos a sentir eh, por, este, por esta pandemia va a ser justamente en nuestra salud mental, por el aislamiento, la incertidumbre, el miedo y las complejidades de esta situación que todos comentamos cuando conversamos con eh, nuestros seres queridos, con la gente que nos acompaña en el trabajo a través de Zoom habitualmente, ¿verdad? Por esta razón, el encuentro de este año está dedicado justamente a este tema, a la salud mental, pues se anticipa que esa será la próxima pandemia. Queremos visibilizar el problema y también entregar herramientas para enfrentar este momento y vivirlo tal vez con un poco más de bienestar o manejando mejor las emociones con más herramientas. Es así como queremos dar inicio a este encuentro destacando el interés que ha tenido esta actividad. Nos sorprendió mucho la cantidad de inscritos, la cantidad de preguntas que recibimos. Nos acompañan personas de distintos lugares de Chile, de Perú, de Argentina, de México, de Honduras, de Colombia, de Paraguay, entre otros países de Latinoamérica. Hola a todos ustedes que están ahí y que hacen posible que este encuentro tenga eh, una llegada esta vez fuera de las fronteras gracias justamente a esta pandemia. En estos momentos hay miles de conectados siguiendo nuestra transmisión. Nos acompañan muchas personas del mundo académico, del mundo empresarial, profesionales de la salud, de la educación, entre otros. Realmente nos emociona poder tener un público tan amplio y tan diverso como es también la sociedad y los desafíos que estamos enfrentando. Queremos agradecer a nuestros media partners, La Tercera, CNN Chile, Radio Bio Bio y El Mostrador, quienes van a estar transmitiendo este encuentro en sus sitios web y redes sociales y también en sus pantallas eh, durante esta semana. Vamos a poder ver segmentos de esta presentación y volver a revisar gracias a todas esas alianzas. Para dar inicio a este encuentro quiero eh, invitar al rector de la Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile, señor Ignacio Sánchez, quien ha jugado un rol muy relevante y activo durante esta pandemia y nos va a saludar dando un contexto sobre el impacto de la salud mental. Rector, buenos días. Buenos días, Paloma. Muchas gracias eh, por eh, la posibilidad de eh, inaugurar esta importante conversación. Rector, eh, estamos muy contentos de tenerlo y lo dejo para sus palabras de inicio. Muchas gracias. Es un agrado poder saludar a los y las asistentes eh, y darles la bienvenida a este nuevo encuentro que organiza el Centro de Innovación UC Anacleto Angelini en conjunto con las fundaciones Rasmus y CAP. Saludo de manera muy especial al señor Juan Enrique Rasmus, presidente de Fundaciones Rasmus y miembro del directorio de CAP, gran colaborador en el proyecto Innovación 2050 en el que se enmarca el encuentro de hoy. Hoy vemos con preocupación, como luego más de un año de, un año de vivir en pandemia con restricciones sanitarias, confinamiento y pérdidas familiares, cómo la calidad de vida de las personas se ha visto afectada, manifestándose en un importante deterioro de la salud mental. Hace algunos meses, el Centro de Encuestas de Estudios Longitudinales de la Universidad Católica, en conjunto con la Asociación Chilena de Seguridad, presentaron el tercer estudio de salud mental UCACHS, un verdadero termómetro de la salud mental que nos mostró una radiografía de lo que está ocurriendo en nuestro país en este ámbito. 
Entre los principales hallazgos, destaca que cerca de un tercio de los encuestados refieren síntomas o presencia de problemas de salud mental. Así también, cerca del 40% de las personas manifestó alteraciones del ánimo, sensación de agobio, trastornos del sueño, problemas de concentración en el trabajo, cansancio y también síntomas de depresión. Por otra parte, en un estudio que se realizó por Ipsos en 30 países, Chile ocupó un preocupante segundo lugar, con un 56% de los consultados que indicaron que su salud mental se ha visto afectada desde que se inició esta grave pandemia. Chile solo fue superado por Turquía, con un 61%, luego Hungría, Italia y Brasil, con un 53%. Conscientes de este grave problema que ha impactado de manera importante la calidad de vida de la población, el tema que nos convoca hoy se refiere precisamente a las consecuencias de esta pandemia en relación a la salud mental de las personas y cómo se puede enfrentar esta sintomatología. Como universidad comprometida con aportar a la comunidad en la que estamos insertos, tenemos la responsabilidad de informar sobre las últimas tendencias en este caso sobre salud mental y bienestar, y entregar también herramientas que permitan a las personas hacer frente a la fatiga causada por esta pandemia. La Universidad Católica ha estado trabajando y aportando en este tema desde el inicio. En la Mesa Social COVID-19 participamos a través de la Escuela de Psicología y de Medicina en un trabajo conjunto con las universidades de Chile, Tarapacá, de la Frontera y el proyecto MIDAP, en la entrega de estrategias orientadas a reducir el impacto de la pandemia sobre la salud mental de la población. Así también se evalúan y elaboran guías de acompañamiento en el duelo. El gobierno implementó la plataforma Saludablemente como una herramienta de apoyo para quienes se sientan abrumados por la crisis sanitaria, social y económica. Plataforma que a la fecha ha recibido más de 180.000 consultas. Muestra esto de que los chilenos y chilenas han ido reconociendo cada vez más que necesitan ayuda son las consultas a través del sitio web del Hospital Digital que mostraron un aumento del 600% en este periodo. Las principales consultas tienen relación con síntomas ansiosos, le siguen la ideación o intento de suicidio incluso, trastornos del ánimo y trastornos mentales severos en relación a la sintomatología de esta población. Resulta también evidente entonces que la salud mental es un tema necesario de abordar, pues es una situación con efectos inmediatos y también en el mediano y largo plazo. Es por eso también que la Universidad Católica, al interior de nuestra comunidad universitaria, estamos trabajando de manera activa en un proyecto de reencuentro, bienestar y salud mental en tiempos de pandemia, porque consideramos que al interior de nuestra comunidad es muy importante preocuparse de toda esta temática. La salud mental entonces impacta directamente en nuestra calidad de vida, en cómo nos relacionamos y en consecuencia en cómo construimos en conjunto una mejor comunidad y también un mejor país. Confío en que con este segundo encuentro de Innovación 2050 sumemos acciones tendientes a ayudar a la población a abordar de mejor forma los efectos de la pandemia en la salud mental. Muchas gracias. Agradecemos la palabra del señor Ignacio Sánchez. Aprovechamos también de agradecer el gran aporte que han hecho a este encuentro de escuelas como la de Psicología, Medicina y Diseño de la Universidad Católica. A continuación, quiero dejar con ustedes al señor Juan Enrique Rasmus. Él es presidente de las fundaciones Rasmus y miembro del directorio de CAP. Desde el mundo empresarial, él ha querido poner una alerta sobre el impacto que la pandemia está teniendo justamente en la salud mental de las personas y cómo podríamos tener mejores herramientas también para enfrentarlo. Juan Enrique, bienvenido. Paloma, buenos días. Muchas gracias. Eh... Gracias a todos. Quiero agradecer primero al, al rector Ignacio Sánchez por el apoyo que él ha dado a este encuentro y felicito a la UCE por realmente el gran aporte que están haciendo durante este periodo de pandemia. Hace dos años empezamos con estos encuentros de Innovación 2050 
como un espacio de reflexión de las grandes tendencias y desafíos que debemos enfrentar. Si bien son temas complejos, queremos mirarlos esperanzados y optimistas desde nuestra capacidad de adaptación. Esto muestra la urgencia de acercar los mundos de la academia, eh, las empresas las, y sobre todo las autoridades. Todos debemos trabajar unidos para encontrar soluciones a estos nuevos desafíos. Este año hemos querido poner una luz sobre el tema de la salud mental, que como describía el rector, ya muestra un deterioro in inquietante y, que debe, y, sab y ya sabemos que impactará a, a millones de personas. Yo personalmente creo que desde el mundo empresarial debemos enfrentarlo como un tema prioritario, contribuyendo a crear ambientes de trabajo, de mayor bienestar, y para eso necesitamos liderazgos conscientes de estas transformaciones. En lo personal, nuevamente, creo que hay una gran oportunidad de mirar a estos desafíos para fortalecernos, robustecer nuestros valores y jugar un rol de relevancia en los territorios donde desarrollamos nuestras actividades. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Juan Enrique. Claramente necesitamos encontrar una forma de enfrentar estos desafíos de una forma sistémica, en colaboración eh, del mundo académico, de la empresa, los gobiernos, la sociedad civil, va a ser fundamental. También ser bien conscientes de cuál es nuestro impacto como líderes dentro de, lo, de, lo, de los entornos en donde estamos, ¿verdad? Pues el renombrado escritor y ganador del Pulitzer, Thomas Friedman, nos acompañó en 2019 en Innovación 2050 y hoy también quiso estar eh, presente. Hello Chile and Latin America. It's a pleasure to greet you again. I'm Thomas Friedman and exactly two years ago I was in Chile with the Rasmus Foundation, CAP and UC Innovation Center for the first version of Innovation 2050. Presenting my book at the time, thank you for being late. In two years since, the acceleration I talked about during that event has only increased. And the pandemic has brought the effects of the globalized world we live in now to everyone's front door. We've also had to put our adaptation skills into practice and indeed redouble them, which have become essential now for every company, country, family, university, and any public institution to survive or thrive in this difficult moment. This new reality requires us to tackle issues that humanity has faced before, but are also now being redoubled, and one of those is mental health. I'm very pleased that you continue to reflect on these issues and their effect on our society, and that you're having the opportunity to have your group be addressed by one of the greatest experts in the world on this mental health challenge, Professor Daniel Goleman. I hope this chance for reflection and this call to action for companies and societies at large to rise to the adaptation challenge of our time. I hope it is met in Chile, met all across Latin America, and that all of you will be thriving in the coming year. Wish that I could be with you. Hugs to everybody in Chile and Latin America. Tom Friedman. Agradecemos a Thomas Friedman por su excelente charla en 2019. Yo estaba ahí como público. Ya nos anticipaba en ese contexto la situación que estamos viviendo hoy día fruto de cómo las distintas crisis, el cambio climático, eh, el crecimiento de la población, afectan una a las otras y finalmente nos enfrentamos cada vez más rápido a mayores desafíos. Les queremos recordar a todos los que están participando en este encuentro que es fundamental eh, justamente su participación. Los queremos invitar a un Unirse a la conversación utilizando el hashtag La Otra Pandemia y el hashtag Daniel Goleman. Los invitamos también a participar utilizando también sus propias redes sociales en contacto con las nuestras. Recibimos ya más de 1.200 preguntas y comentarios por parte de ustedes. En esta imagen que vamos a ver a continuación, vemos la gran cantidad de inquietudes y preocupaciones del público. Hicimos esta pregunta, ¿qué le preocupa a nuestra audiencia? ¿Qué les preocupa a ustedes? Y encontraron todos estos conceptos, salud mental y pobreza, mujeres y teletrabajo, incertidumbre, derecho a la salud mental, encierro. De alguna forma son estos temas que también se han levantado en los estudios, los que surgieron simplemente preguntándoles a ustedes cómo se sentían en este contexto y cuáles son hoy día sus mayores preocupaciones en el presente y el futuro. Sin duda, este espacio ha sido muy desafiante para todos. Ahora vamos a dar paso a lo que nos convoca. Hoy vamos a tener esta charla que habla de la otra pandemia, de la pandemia de salud mental 
eh, y es el momento justamente de dar paso a nuestro gran invitado en este set virtual, de conocernos virtualmente como acaba de ocurrir y como nos encontramos con ustedes. Si usted todavía no lo conoce, le quiero contar que Daniel Goleman es autor de los bestsellers Inteligencia Emocional e Inteligencia Social. Se ha distinguido por su perspectiva como uno de los más notables pensadores y divulgadores en la psicología contemporánea. Además, Daniel co-dirige el Consorcio de la Investigación de Inteligencia Emocional Organizacional de la Universidad de Rutgers y cofundó la Organización Colaborativa para el Aprendizaje Académico, Social y Emocional. Eh, también ha sido reconocido con el Lifetime Career Award de la Asociación Estadounidense de Psicología por sus contribuciones a la divulgación de la ciencia, algo que necesitamos hoy más que nunca. Welcome Daniel, we are very grateful to have you here as we have said already, so now the stage is yours. Uh, thank you so much, it's my pleasure. Uh, I understand from what I read and hear that there are many troubles in Chile and throughout Latin America, actually around the world, In Chile, there's particularly, there's been civil unrest. Uh, we're all suffering from the COVID pandemic, uh, which has brought, uh, sadly, many economic failures. The total of that for each of us as individuals is it, it, there's a huge stress. And I can't solve the larger problems that are causing the stress, but I want to remind you that we have a choice point. There are the events of our lives that cause stress or that's an opportunity for stress, but then there's our reaction. And how we react is private. That's up to us. This is where we have a choice point uh, to lower our stress. And that's what I would like to share with you today. I'm speaking both as a psychologist uh, and as a science journalist. So... Let me start with this model of emotional intelligence. There are four parts. The first part is self-awareness, knowing what we're feeling, why we feel it, how it impacts how we uh, can act, how we're thinking about things. Second part is self-management. Once we know how we feel, what do we do with those feelings? Are they disruptive feelings? Do they call our attention away from what's important to us right now? Uh, can we manage those disruptive feelings? I'm going to talk a lot about how to do that. And then there's the positive side of self-management, staying optimistic, seeing the possibilities that are brighter for the future, keeping our eye on the goal despite whatever obstacles might arise, uh, realizing that we and everyone around us can get better, can improve, can grow and develop a growth mindset. Then there's empathy, tuning in to other people, how they feel, and then using all of that to have effective interactions. But it all starts with how we manage ourselves. So there are three different ways we can react. Uh, and one of them has to do with letting our emotions, our negative emotions, get out of control. There are two kinds of worry. One is where we think about uh, what's helping us or what's hurting us, and we just keep thinking about it. That's the far right of that. If we could keep it on the screen for a moment more, uh, there's the part of us that gets extremely upset and stays upset and keeps thinking about the same problem. There's another way of reacting, which is not caring, disengagement. This can lead to depression. But then there's us at our best, where we perform at our peak and our well-being is, uh, is absolutely optimum. That's where we want to be, at the optimal state. So the question is, how can we go from particularly the high stress to the optimum? And I'd like to share with you some ways to do that. For one thing, it's important to understand what makes us anxious, what makes us depressed. It's not the events themselves, it's how we think about them. Uh, you know, we may think, uh, well, it's hopeless, there's, there's nothing I can do about it, or no one cares about me. These are the kinds of thoughts that keep coming back to us that will create our inner state of depression 
or anxiety. This is what's called rumination. It's a useless kind of worry because we keep coming up with the same problems, the same negativity, but we never find a solution. If we found a solution, we could drop it. We could do that thing. But if we only think about what makes us upset, then we continue to make ourselves more and more upset. So the first technique I want to share with you comes from what's called mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. I have to say my wife is the, a pioneer in this field. She wrote a book called Emotional Alchemy, Emotional Alchemia. Uh, it's in Spanish if you want to look at it. But it's about how to combine methods from psychotherapy, cognitive therapy particularly, with mindfulness, becoming aware of what we're feeling. And the first step is to simply notice the thought, notice the feeling. What is it that keeps happening in my mind, uh, in my heart, over and over again, that brings me to that stress, to the far right of this curve? And how can we move from that to the optimum state? Well, for one thing, it helps to give a name to what you're feeling. Oh, I have that feeling in my stomach. I'm feeling anxious again now. So if you name it, research at UCLA tells us it already changes what's going on in your brain. It takes energy away from the worrisome thought and gives it to the thinking part of your brain, the part that understands what's going on. The second fundamental point in this practice is to realize you don't have to believe those thoughts. The idea that it's hopeless or no one cares about me, those are just thoughts. They're what you, the stories you're telling yourself, but you don't have to buy into them. And the third step is to recall something that disconfirms those thoughts. Evidence to the contrary. Uh, for example, good things have happened to me. Good things could happen to me. That's an antidote to the thought that it's hopeless. Or people actually do like me, do care about me, do love me. That's an antidote uh, to that thought that no one cares about me. And it helps to uh, sometimes make a little flashcard, write down those positive thoughts, and then look at them when you realize that you're being caught up in that negative loop. And if you do this over and over again, it weakens the thoughts that are creating the depression and anxiety. I mentioned my wife's book, and there's some wonderful books by Aaron Beck, uh, who developed cognitive therapy that go into more detail about this method. I recommend it. There's another quick way to go from that stress to your best self, where you feel a sense of well-being. And this comes from uh, the world of yoga, but it's being used, for example, even by military, uh, because it, the data, the research shows it works. It changes us from being caught up in worry and distress, what's called sympathetic nervous system uh, activity. And it brings us to the recovery mode, the relaxed mode, what's called parasympathetic nervous system activity. It's very simple, uh, and I'll lead you through it. You take a deep breath in, so your belly fills. You hold that as long as is comfortable. Then you exhale as long as you can. And after exhaling, you start again. Deep breath in. Hold it as long as you can, and then exhale very slowly. And if you do this six to nine times, right on the spot, it changes your physiology. It changes the state of your body. You go from the stress state to a relaxed state. And I recommend trying it daily so that you can do it on the spot when you need it the most. And there's a third exercise I'd like to share with you. Uh, this is called mindfulness of the breath. It's something that's been very well studied. I just finished writing a book uh, called about the science of meditation, the scientific findings. It turns out that if you do this exercise, which I'll show you in a moment, uh, it makes you more calm. 
you're upset, you're triggered less often. When you do get upset, we're not ready for this, please. Uh, when you do get upset, then you recover more quickly and you don't get as upset as much. The part of the brain uh, that's that brown part, that's where the upset comes from. It's the emotional centers in the middle of the brain. And when it gets triggered, it takes over our rational brain, the prefrontal cortex, the brain's boss, the executive center. It's not a good state. But this happens less and less once we begin to practice these methods. So uh, it also helps us focus better. We can make better decisions. We can think more clearly. And this means, for example, that if you're a student, you'll do better on your exams. You can learn better. Or if you're busy at work and you're multitasking, you know, when you're doing something very important, your concentration starts up here, but then it gets lower and lower as we get distracted and start doing other things. So uh, that means that when we go back to that task, it takes us a while to get focused again, unless we did the exercise I'm about to show you. It's very simple. It helps to sit up straight, but not tense. Uh, and to close your eyes if you're comfortable and bring your awareness to your breath. Breathing in, breathing out. Just know the full in-breath, the full out-breath. Start again with the next breath. Be fully aware of the sensation of breathing. Breathing in, breathing out. When your mind wanders off and some thought and you notice it wandered, just bring it back to the next breath and start again. Breathing in, breathing out. Sometimes people count their breath to help them focus. One on the in-breath, two on the out-breath, three on the in-breath four on the out breath. And this helps calm that center that's there in brown, the emotional brain. And in fact, if you do it daily, we find it makes you less likely to become stressed, to become depressed. So this is a very powerful method if you do it. And we find that the more you do it, the better it works. I want to talk to you about the social brain. And I'll, I'll start by telling you about a famous study that was done with uh, seminary students. People are studying to become ministers and priests. Uh, and uh, they were given a topic for a sermon that they were going to practice and be judged on. And one by one, they went to another building to give the sermon. Half the students were given the parable of the Good Samaritan, the person who stopped to help the stranger in need by the side of the road. Half of them had other topics from the Bible. And then as they went across from one building to another, they passed in a courtyard a man who was bent over and moaning in pain. And the question is, did they stop to help the stranger in need by the side of the road? More interestingly, did it matter if they're thinking about the Good Samaritan Actually, it didn't. The most important thing was that they felt they're under time pressure. If you're time pressure, no way you're going to notice that other person. And this is the point. There's a spectrum of awareness that goes from uh, being self-focused, being completely uh, immersed in what my to-do list is, the practice sermon, what I have to do next. You don't notice other people. But then you might notice, you might tune in, you might empathize, you might see that person needs help, and then you might act compassionately. You might help the other person. Uh, and this has to do with the social brain. This is very important, newly discovered in neuroscience. It turns out that the front part of our brain has many circuits that are designed to tune into the brain of the person we're with and form 
an invisible brain-to-brain -brain link. It's instant, it's unconscious, it's automatic, and it tells us what the other person is feeling, what the other person is doing, what they intend. This helps us keep the uh, interaction we're having online. So you see these two brains and then the arrows which represent the action of the social brain. This is what makes emotions contagious. If we're feeling upbeat and wonderful, then other people around us catch that emotion. In fact, your study at Yale with bosses and teams, and it turns out if the boss is in a positive mood, people on the team catch that mood and they perform better. If the boss is stressed and anxious, people catch that mood and their performance goes down. And I think this applies to parents, to teachers, to doctors and nurses. Anywhere there's a more powerful person and a less powerful person. It's just human nature for us to pay more attention to and put more importance on what the most powerful person in the room says and does. And that's why that person is a sender of feelings. So you see it, for example, at uh, Harvard Medical School, they did a study with doctors and patients where they filmed them during an interaction and uh, also measured their physiology. And afterwards, the patient looked at a video of that and said, here's, here's where the doctor really listened, really heard, really understood me. Here's where the doctor wasn't tuned in. In other words, they're monitoring the social brain. And it turned out that when the patient said the doctor wasn't listening, didn't understand, the two physiologies weren't connected. But when the patient said, yeah, the doctor really heard, really understand, really cared, then they had, uh, their physiology was like two birds flying in formation. They were really connected. So it's important that we pay full attention to the person we're with because that's the basis for rapport, for simpatico. It's important to understand, too, that there are three kinds of empathy. There's cognitive empathy, I know how you think. Uh, there's emotional empathy, I know how you feel. And then there's caring, concern. I want to help you, I care about you. And these are all different circuits in the social brain. So it's that third kind of uh empathy, the caring, the concern that a parent feels in loving a child. This is what allows us to help someone who's really suffering. Because if we have this inner well-being, if we have this state of being able to love the other person, we can be present to them no matter what their suffering might be. Otherwise, we might be overwhelmed by their distress. Uh, and that, of course, leads to people burning out because they can't take it anymore. So the social brain has the capacity to give us the love or caring or concern for the person in distress. And there's an exercise that enhances this ability in all of us because our well-being is not just about me, but about us, about the people we connect with. We can spread well-being. And uh, the exercise is very simple. It's called the circle of caring. And you start by, as we did with the mindfulness of the breath, sit up in a, a, a dignified but relaxed pose and close your eyes and think of someone who's been kind to you, who's really cared about you, someone you're grateful to. And make a wish for them. Maybe you safe, happy, healthy. May you have well-being in your life. Just make those wishes silently to that person you appreciate so much. And then think of yourself and make the same wishes for yourself. May I be safe, happy, healthy. May I, may I have well-being. And just with a focus on yourself now, make that wish. And then you bring to mind people you love, people you naturally care about, your family, your children, your friends, whoever it may be. And you make the same wishes for them. May you be safe, happy, healthy. May you have well-being.
And then you broaden the circle to include just acquaintances, people you run into but don't really know, but strangers even. But make the wish. May you be safe, happy, healthy. May you have well-being. And then finally, you can make that wish to everyone everywhere. May you all be safe, happy, healthy. May you have well-being. And research at the Max Planck Institute in Germany shows that this strengthens circuits in the social brain for caring. And this is another practice that you can do daily. Uh, for example, after you've done the breath exercise I showed you, you can add this circle of caring and it leaves you in a better state and it leaves you more likely actually to help someone. The research shows that people who do this regularly are more likely to be altruistic, to be compassionate, to help someone in need, to care about other people, to give to charities and so on. And then finally, there's some very important research that I want to share with you uh, about uh, how someone in power impacts the people around them, whether it's a boss at work or someone who uh, might be a parent with a child or a teacher or maybe a physician. And it shows, this is research from executives, but I think it generalizes to all those cases. What kind of emotional climate do they create? I mean, there are four very positive, and you can say teaching styles or parenting styles. The first is the visionary uh, leader who articulates a shared purpose that has meaning for all of us. It's very inspiring. It creates a very positive feeling. There's a leader who understands a part of your job as a leader is to coach, to help people get better, not to dismiss them as they are, but to have a growth mindset, to understand that people can improve and you can help them. And then there's uh, the leader who knows that having a good time together, the affiliative leader, is not a waste of time because it creates social capital. It creates affiliation. It creates uh, a sense where people will be there for each other. And then there's the consensus leader who, particularly if you're making a decision that affects people, get their input, ask their opinion. This also has a positive impact. But then there are two styles that are a little negative. One is the leader who only focuses on targets, the uh, impulsar, the uh, pace setter, this is called in English. It means that you expect people to be as good as you are. Well, you're probably a perfectionist. You think about what you did wrong and could do better, and you judge other people through that lens. You only give failing grades. You don't give praise, and that unfortunately creates a very negative emotional climate. And then there's the, the boss, the uh, command and control leader. Just do it because I'm the boss. I say so. Uh, I, I, who doesn't think twice about blowing up at people, getting angry. This sadly has a very negative impact on the person who receives that, uh, on the emotional climate, on everyone who witnesses it. So I just wanted to call your attention to these various styles of leadership. And I think with that, uh, I will close my remarks and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel, for your inspiring presentation. We have heard you with so much attention. Uh, it has been very, a very peaceful talk. It's not very usual to us to hear uh, someone talking in, in, in this way. So it's, it's very new, but very, uh, we, we, really, we really thank you for that. I would like to talk with you um, about some ideas that uh, appear during your presentation. First of all, is we are now living um, times of change, uh, moments that we have never thought that we will be living. Now is the pandemic, but soon will be also climate change, technological revolution. Uh, what could you recommend us to be better adapt to this situation and not to suffer too much? Well, I think it's a very complex question. Uh, particularly, I think the most urgent 
global issue is going to be climate change. Right now, uh, I'm in the middle of a heat wave. I live a little north of New York City, and we're having our summer. We're having our winter, of course. And uh, I think that it's going to become worse and worse. So the question is, how can we best handle uh, what's going to come? It seems inevitable. And I think that uh, the main point of my message today has been <laughs> that it's up to each of us to handle our individual response, how we react. You can't control the larger forces at work in creating the stresses, but we can manage ourselves and learn to manage better. So uh, one of the key points about how to self-manage and how to handle it is to apply the methods, for example, that I shared. I uh, am someone who's a, a serious meditator, for example. I start every day by doing a practice, like a breath practice, and I find it helps me stay clearer during the rest of the day. And I think we're going to need clarity. We're going to need calm in order to make the best decisions going forward. And uh, in the future, I think this will be, for example, about the products that we buy, the things we do, uh, what we practice uh, in our lives, and then multiply that by a million or a billion because the problems that we face are collective problems. They're problems we can only solve together. Now you you taught us a technique to to try to develop the social brain. But there are so many people that doesn't have any 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 tool or or they are very focused on themselves. How do you how do you recommend us to train our social brain uh, more? How how to be aware of of the rest that, that, that are surrounded us. I think that the uh, emotional intelligence model has the secret there. Because remember, the first part is about managing ourselves, self-awareness, self-management. The second part is about tuning into the other person. We may be self-focused, we may be concerned only about ourselves, but the truth is we live together. We can only survive together. Our families, our friends, our communities, our networks, are what matter in handling these larger problems. And if we're only self-focused, we're like that person who doesn't notice the uh, person in need by the side of the road, the stranger. We want to become more open to what's going on in other people. That's why I introduced the circle of caring. That's why it makes such a difference to tune in to the people around us. And that practice, which includes, by the way, focusing on ourselves and wishing ourselves well-being, wishing ourselves safety, health, uh, happiness. We want to extend that to the people we care about and even beyond. And that changes the social brain. It makes us more capable of that caring, of that compassion, finally, because I feel each of us has a set of talents. Each of us has strengths. Each of us has things we love doing. And each of us has some sense of wanting to help the people we love, or maybe even the greater good, the larger community. If we can align those three things, what I'm good at, what I like doing, what I love doing even, and helping helping myself, helping others, then that creates in each of us a sense of well-being, a sense of satisfaction about the actions we take. And I think if all of us had that, if we each contributed our part of what we can do, then we would have a better world. We have some questions from the audience and I have this video that I'm going to show you. Soy Valeria Zárate de Paraguay y tengo 19 años. La pandemia me apartó de mis amigos y de mi rutina habitual. 
Cuando iba a iniciar mi universidad, llegó el confinamiento y se suspendió todo. Hoy estoy retomando el estudio en la virtualidad, pero aún siento que es muy lento. ¿Cómo hago para no sentirme sin ganas ni esperanza? I, I, I know this question well because I have granddaughters the same age and for a year and a half they've been doing school virtually and one of the biggest losses is friendships, connection to the other people that we care about. And for someone 18, 19 at that age, it's our relationships that matter. In fact, uh, it, it often matters more than our family. Our friendships are really important and being able only to communicate by uh, phone or by Zoom, or not at all, is a big loss. Of course, it's only temporary, but even so, it hurts. Uh, and this disconnection is one of the big sources of stress. I talked about the social brain. There's a sad fact that the social brain is designed for in-person connection. Uh, when we're on uh, uh, any teleconference program, the computer is actually not designed well for that because to have eye contact, which is what really makes a connection strong, you're not looking at the image of the person. You have to choose. Am I going to look at the camera or the person? And this, and of course, it gets worse uh, as you go on phone. You have no image of facial expression, which communicates what you're really feeling. And if it's text only, then there's a danger, particularly if you don't know the person well, of misunderstanding, misinterpreting, and getting emotionally triggered. So I think the answer in this difficult situation is to make more effort to reach out to our friends more, to call them, to connect with them in whatever way we can, uh, and to do it more often, because it's uh, become more important in this situation of a vacuum, of a void, of personal connection. It's more important to have whatever connection we can. Well, in fact, right now, it looks like harder because technology has been during this pandemic a coin of two sides in one hand we have it, it has allowed us to stay connected to relate to work to study uh, but it also generates fatigue and frustration and we spend so much time knowing the world through a screen so what's the balance point and how How can we cultivate a kindness through a screen, you know, throughout the screen? Yeah, and I think it starts with cultivating kindness for ourselves, our own well-being, taking time uh, between Zoom calls or whatever screen you're facing to restore yourself, whatever that may be. Uh, you know, being with your favorite pet, your, being with a child, uh, remembering your breath coming back to the present. These are restorative things that you can do. And if you restore yourself, then you're more able to be present in a positive way for the other person, uh, whether it's by uh, technology or actually in person. Uh, the, who you are depends on your internal state. What you're able to give depends on that too. So your own well-being helps you foster the well-being in other people. Why um, should someone that hasn't know yet the good part of be being kind and he has or she uh, only, only learn how to fight or how to defend himself or herself from the world, mm. how can you uh, take that and put it on the trash And, and rebuild yourself. How can you do that? It, it looks like a, a, a huge thing, no? Yeah, it's a very difficult challenge that you're talking about, but there is a way and it has to do with trust. If, if the person who has been so defensive that they've been on the offense, they've been fighting their way through life, develops a relationship with someone who they really can depend on, who really cares about them, who they can trust. That's the start 
of their building a more positive way of relating to the world. Sometimes this comes from a religious experience. Sometimes it comes from a reparative relationship, uh, being with uh, a partner who cares about you, uh, who you don't have to be defensive with, who you don't have to fight. This helps teach a person how to connect in a good way with other people. But I think you're right. I think that particular challenge means uh, it takes a longer time. It, it's a bigger, longer road that someone has to travel in order to get there. But it's doable. Now I, I have another question. Uh, he's a teacher and I'm gonna show you the question and then we continue this conversation. ¿Qué trabajo deberíamos hacer como unidad educativa para que esta etapa de pandemia sea de aprendizajes significativos y no de malos recuerdos? That's such a wonderful question. It is. Uh, I, I am a champion of what we call social emotional learning, which is teaching children, students, even university and graduate level, uh, how to take care of themselves, how to care for other people, how to tune in. And it's added on to the standard academic curriculum, doesn't really take much time away, but it makes sure that people continue to develop as a person, not just accumulating knowledge through school. And I think during this pandemic, during uh, this virtual education, it's particularly important to have these lessons continue so that we build a stronger strengths in how to be a positive person, how to be a calmer person, how to be a caring person, how to be kinder. So I think we need to pay attention to this dimension of human development, even under the pandemic uh, and the lockdown and virtual education that's going on. I think it becomes even more important to help students and help each of us strengthen this part of our inner resource. Yeah, maybe maybe it's time to teach those values that we lost in the past, no? Like kindness and, and all the things that you are saying. What recommendation would you make to teachers who are very demanding and stressed to better handle the situation of on a personal level, but also to be greater uh, contribution to their students? Well, I think you're talking about teacher stress, which is a real factor. Uh, it's not easy to teach virtually uh, when you've been used to teaching face-to-face -face in the classroom. So it's an added difficulty to think, how can I give the same lesson online, for example? Sure. So I think the teachers particularly, or professors, would do well to add to their daily routine some way to manage their stress, a self-management strategy that helps them stay more calm while they're dealing with this enhanced intellectual demand uh, for teaching online. So I recommend the methods that I shared. They do work. There's a lot of science behind them. Uh, and use them daily. And the more you can do it, the better off you'll be, no matter what your challenge is. And by the way, this goes way beyond the challenge of teachers. I think all of us are challenged today. And so I think each of us would do well to be kind to ourselves, to enhance our own well-being by increasing our inner capacity and adding some of these exercises to our daily routine so that we can face the struggles, face the stresses uh, in a better place. Then we have another question from uh, a new person. Uh, she ha she's in a particular situation. I want you to hear her, please. Hola, Daniel. Soy Leonor Fernández. En este mes cumpliré 90 años. Como mucha gente de mi edad, estoy en un largo confinamiento por temor a los contagios. ¿Qué consejo nos darías para volver a retomar nuestra vida eh, y superar el cambio que significaría esto para nosotros? 
I think、uh, I understand the situation very well.、Uh, my wife's mother is almost 90, and she has not been vaccinated, so she's in the same predicament.、Uh, and I think the first thing to do is to protect yourself, not to put yourself in social situations or any situation where you might be exposed to the virus, the COVID 19.、Uh, that's number one. The second thing to do is to Be kind to yourself to manage your own anxiety about the situation. There is, of course, a realistic fear of becoming sick、uh, and getting the virus, but then there are fears on top of the fear, and it's those extra fears that you want to minimize. So, this is why the methods that I shared can be helpful. And by the way, at any age, We're all breathing. We can all pay attention to our breath.、Uh, we can control our breath in ways that help minimize our anxiety, our panic, our worry. And I recommend that. So remember, there are two kinds of worry there's the realistic one, you want to make sure you're safe. I think that's important. But then on top of that, there's the fantasy about what might happen. Uh, all the extra worries, or worries about our loved ones, what about them?、Uh, worries about the state of the world. And it's these that we can reduce in terms of how they upset us. I think that's important too. Let's travel to the company's world and, and let's、uh, think about what you said at the end of your presentation. What, what kind of leadership? We, do we need、uh, for the future? Because we're so、uh, challenged now. Everyone、uh, is, is changing their, their own lives. And now、uh, we need new companies, more adaptable,、um, more flexible, maybe. What do you think about it? What kind of leaders do we need? I, I think that、uh, leadership is going to become more important going into the future. Remember, I talked about how. Emotions are contagious from the leader outward. So, leaders need to start by leading themselves, by managing their own feelings,、uh, not letting their own anxieties take them over, but rather staying positive, staying hopeful,、uh, seeing that things can improve, and staying nimble, staying agile, being adaptable because the challenges are increasing, they're shifting all the time, which means that there are always new opportunities for business. Uh, something that you've been doing may not work so well anymore, but what could you be doing? What are your strengths? What are your skills? But once you have that sense of strategy and how to nimbly change your strategy going forward, as a leader, you can only get there through your people. You have to communicate, you have to inspire,、uh, you have to tell people what the possibilities are going into the future. So、uh, it means that. A leader needs to stay positive and communicate that positivity. There's another thing leaders can do, and that is to articulate a shared mission that is inspiring to other people, a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning. And by the way, this will be more and more important in the future. Younger generations, millennials, Gen Z,、uh, are saying, For me, it's more important that I find work that matches my sense of purpose and meaning than I just make a living.、Uh, and particularly talented people, the most、uh, key people for your company, are going to want your organization to have a purpose that suits them, that makes sense to them, that compels them, that inspires them. So, for example, as the global warming crisis increases, it's important that your organization or your company have as part of its strategy or mission ways to counter that because younger people will care more and more about that. So, I think that from a leader point of view in a company, a few things. One is manage yourself, the second is inspire your people. And those two things together will keep your company sound going into the future. Daniel, this pandemic has been a very good time to think, to, to make,、um, to, to give some space to philosophy. 
What kinds of new thoughts has this pandemic brought to you? Well, one thing that I've been thinking about more and more is the values dimension. Uh, what matters to people, what has meaning to us, as I said, a sense of purpose. Uh, and how can we have good work? How can we have work that aligns our skill set, uh, what we're passionate about, and what matters to us? That, I think, is more and more important as we go forward. And I think that there are a few things that companies will need in the future, leaders will need in the future. Uh, one is this sense of purpose. The other is a systems understanding, uh, not just thinking about what's been working for us now, but what is it that we'll need in the future? And to understand that, we need to know how is technology changing? How is the culture changing? How is the economy changing? How is my business changing? How is the environment changing? We need to put all of that together in a systems understanding. And I think this, too, is going to be increasingly important. We are finishing this, this conversation and I would like to know what is your optimistic view of this period? Do you think that you have taken something from this uh, moment of the history that it looks so sad and so difficult, but we are changing? What do you think is good from, for, for, of this moment uh, for humanity? I feel that having stopped everything in the lockdown situation means that we can restart in a new way. And I'm hoping that this will be the case. Uh, my optimism, which I have to say is something that I, I tend to go for rather than pessimism, my optimistic outlook is that when we start again, we'll rethink what's important, we'll rethink what matters, we'll rethink what is for the greater good not just for myself. Of course, we have to take care of ourselves and our families, but beyond that, what can we do which will help everyone uh, as we face the problems going into the future? Thank you very much, Daniel. I wish for you a good life uh, to be huh. here, for you, for your family, and for all the people that I don't know, but is surrounding you. I, have you, I hope you have a great life that I'm in a lucky situation, but I wish that for everyone. And I wish we all had that. Agradecemos a Daniel Goleman por el tiempo que ha compartido con nosotros y las valiosas herramientas que nos deja para lograr tal vez un mayor bienestar desde la realidad y las posibilidades que cada uno tiene, ¿verdad? Sin olvidar que hoy más que nunca necesitamos conversar de salud mental para resolver problemas en conjunto, recurriendo al diálogo, a la empatía y a la compasión, valores que como la amabilidad que comentábamos han quedado tan atrás, ¿verdad? Tenemos que agradecer a todos ustedes que han estado ahí, eh, por toda la participación que han tenido, por los comentarios a través de las redes sociales, de cómo nos han acompañado a través de, del país y del mundo de Latinoamérica. Todos ustedes que están ahí, muchas gracias. A ustedes también les deseamos que tengan una linda vida, que estén sanos eh, y que tengan bienestar y logren a, aprender tal vez de esta charla lo que hemos aprendido nosotros. Ojalá haya sido bueno para ustedes. Les quiero decir gracias a todos. Chao, chao u hola a los que quieran saludar. Muchas gracias por estar con nosotros virtualmente. Tenemos que encontrar nuevas maneras de conectarnos, de secretar endorfinas, de sentirnos eh, y querernos, aunque sea de forma virtual, ¿verdad? Eh, con esta imagen hermosa de todos juntos, eh, queremos empezar a despedir este evento. Eh, este contenido va a ser emitido por CNN Chile eh, y va a quedar disponible en el canal de YouTube del Centro de Innovación de la Universidad Católica. Nos vamos a quedar ahora con una de las reflexiones que eh, nos trajo Daniel Goleman y queremos compartir con ustedes. Y dice... Cuando empecemos de nuevo, repensemos lo que es importante para todos mientras enfrentamos los problemas avanzando hacia el futuro. No vamos a tener una pausa definitiva que nos permita hacer un nuevo plan. Esta pausa, esta forma de encontrarnos es lo que nos permite imaginar tal vez 
con otro tempo, con otra reflexividad, un futuro diferente para nosotros. Pero los cambios van a seguir viniendo, como dijo en Innovación 2050, en la charla anterior, eh, Thomas Friedman, ¿verdad? Van a seguir los desafíos para adelante y por lo mismo tenemos que ser capaces de pensar en colectivo, ayudarnos, estar juntos, mejorar, pensar en nosotros mismos, aprender a mirarnos y al mismo tiempo mirar los desafíos y tratar de dar lo mejor para que esto de verdad sea una sociedad mejor para todos, ¿verdad? Gracias a todos ustedes, gracias por acompañarnos, nos encontramos más adelante, ojalá en otra Innovación 2050, para que ojalá en el 2050 estemos cada vez mejor. Gracias a todos, chao, chao, que les vaya bien.